Okay, good morning, and thank you all for coming in with the weather. Um, today, we're going to talk about pacemakers and defibrillators, but first, let me just remind you, you have a homework assignment to do on Friday. Did anybody have any questions from any of the homework problems? Okay, well, try to get a start on it so that on Wednesday you can bring your questions and we can discuss them. Uh, you want to keep reading, we're going to keep going over chapter 7, even on Wednesday we're going to be talking about the electroencephalogram, so talk about the brain instead of the heart, but today we're going to be talking about the heart. So, let us begin. <clears throat> if you're interested in the medical device industry and how pacemakers and defibrillators were developed, this is a very good book. I would recommend it, it's not required. Machines in our hearts. <clears throat> it tells the story of how the how the pacemaker was invented and <clears throat> companies like Medtronic got developed. Um, just gives you a lot of insight into how uh, the industrial applications of a lot of this stuff were like. So, let us begin <clears throat> with the first pacemaker. And it all started with World War II and a lot of, um, a lot of people went and when they fought World War II, they had to learn new technology, new medical practices, which they brought back from the war and then started applying to civilian life. And here's Paul Zoll, one an example. He wanted to develop a way to stimulate the heart electrically. So, uh, and this was for use in the hospital short term. So what he did, he got a, what's called a grass stimulator. Grass is just the company that makes it. It's a stimulator that can output a certain pulses of current and voltage. And he hooked it up to, uh, it's, it's powered from the wall outlet. And he got a couple skin electrodes, put them on the surface of the skin. And then he was able to apply stimuli to the chest, which could then stimulate the heart. And you could pace the heart. So it was the first example of uh, of electrical stimulation of the heart artificially used in medicine. So that was 1952, big breakthrough. Uh, here's an example of one of the patients who was getting this. Now realize these are probably fairly big stimulators, they're hooked to the wall outlet. So this person's pushing the stimulator around on this cart, it's got a big wire uh, extension cord going back to the wall outlet, but they were able to get up, walk around, it functioned within the hospital. So uh, it, it made a big difference to people who had certain cardiac illnesses. But there are problems. And, and one of the things that engineers do uh, is they look at devices and they look at the problems and then they try to fix them. And they get new devices and then they look at those problems. So let's look at the problems with this first pacemaker. Okay, uh, well, you had to use fairly large stimuli because you're putting a, a current through the chest. It's got to get all the way into the heart and still be strong enough to stimulate the heart. So that means the, the current densities that are right on the electrodes on the chest are fairly large. You have to put large voltages. You can cause the muscles right under these electrodes to contract and stimulate pain receptors. So it wasn't the most comfortable thing. It wasn't terribly uncomfortable, but it was at some pain. These electrodes are on there for days. You can get some kind of skin problems right underneath the electrodes. Okay, now this is plugged into a wall outlet. So if there's a, a power shortage, um, a power outage, that's a problem. Now usually hospitals have backup generators, but still, if you're depending on this for stimulation and you, you have uh, you know, two minutes without the electrical power, that could be a problem. Even worse is a power surge. Because if you have a lightning strike on the hospital and there's a sudden spike in voltage through the uh, um, through their electrical system, it could, in theory at least, come and zap you out of the chest. So you could it's all of a sudden have a defibrillator that's going where you don't want it to go. All right, so uh, it's not really very mobile. It can you can push it around the cart on that, but you can't go much farther than the length of your power cord. Uh, so you've solved a short-term sort of local problem with mobility, but you haven't solved any long-term problems. And also, this solves the acute problem, acute versus chronic. Acute short-term, chronic is long-term. You've solved, or at least made improvements to the acute problem of needing to pace the heart, but you haven't really solved the chronic problem. So there's still lots of things to be done. 
Now, one of the first people who began to develop the pacemaker in more detail is Earl Bakken. Uh, here, Earl Bakken is one of those people who developed uh, his technology in truly in his garage in, in Minneapolis. Uh, he started the company Medtronic 1949 just in that garage there. He and his uh, brother or a friend who was also an engineer, they worked designing uh, uh, electronics and they found that the hospital nearby uh, often had electrical issues, electronics problems, so they began to collaborate with the hospital. And things developed, and all of a sudden they had a, a major company. And they built the first battery-powered mobile pacemaker. Here's a picture of it right here, uh, a little more of a close-up. That's the electrical circuit. Remember this, in 1958, you just had transistors, so you don't have to rely on, on uh, voltage on, on vacuum tubes anymore, but it's just the very beginnings of the transistor revolution. So what do you have? Well, first of all, this is battery powered. So you've gotten rid of your power cord problem. You can wear this thing around. Now it's much more mobile. Um, it, it has basically two knobs. It has a, a pulse rate. So you can adjust the rate of stimulation, and it has an amplitude output, so you can adjust the strength of the stimulus. And those are basically the two knobs. There's an on-off switch, and that's all that it can control. It's still uh, stimulating, well, in, in this case, uh, in the very first case, it was stimulating to the surface electrodes, but eventually we're going to be able to put electrodes through the skin. But this design actually came to Bakken um, he was, he was looking at, reading through a magazine, an electronics uh, magazine for hobbyists, and he saw an uh, electronic metronome. You know, the metronomes that most piano uh, players they used to use were just mechanical things that looked like upside down pendula. But they were just developing electronic ones. He saw this circuit and he said, aha, that's exactly what I need to pace the heart just once a second. So he developed this. And here's a, more, a little more fancy picture of it, showing an old-fashioned metronome, the, the newer metronome of, of facing the heart and his electrical circuit behind it. So, he built this. And by the way, Earl Bakken uh, just died last year. He was the, the leader and the founder of Medtronic. I went to a IEEE uh, meeting on using in, with... Uh, Applying Engineering to Biology in Minneapolis several years ago, probably 10 years ago now. And he was there at uh, shaking hands with all the people at the meeting. It was really an honor to, to just get to meet him. Uh, I, but uh, he died last year in Hawaii. He had moved to Hawaii, he couldn't take the Minneapolis winters anymore. But he was, a, he was a big person in the field. And also, if you ever go to Minneapolis, they probably have the only museum that I know of in the world that's dedicated exclusively to bioelectricity. So if you're tired of the art museums and all the other museums, you want to see a museum about bioelectricity, they have one, the Bakken Museum in Minneapolis. So here's one of the first uses. And this is a, a famous surgeon, uh, C. Walton Lillehy, who was doing heart surgery on children. Remember we talked a little bit about some of the problems the heart can have when you're a child and you're just born, and now they can extend on through the childhood. He would go through and he'd do heart surgery, but one of the problems is sometimes during heart surgery, despite his utmost care, he could do some at least temporary damage to the AV node. AV node connects the atrium to the ventricles, and that means he could induce heart block, and usually this would resolve itself in a few weeks. But a few weeks is a long time to have heart block. So what they did is this was the first patients who really got the uh, Medtronic pacemakers were patients who had this heart surgery and needed to uh, recover from it. And they were able to then pace the heart for a few weeks until the AV node healed itself and was able to start functioning again. So it was a big success. They even made the, uh, the Saturday Evening Post, which was a big magazine back in those days. I'm not sure if it even exists anymore. Here's sort of their advertisement for it. Uh, they did now, in this version, they do have the rate control. They can go 60 to 180 beats per minute. Well, remember, 60 is the lowest level that's uh, 
it's considered normal. 100 would be the fastest level is normal. But if you wanted to say exercise, you could always turn your rate up a little higher and then you could exercise. But you had to adjust it sort of by feedback. Had some handles you could carry. The battery's down here. So uh, let's see what else. They had a little visual indicator, a little light that flashed. And they thought in the next design, in the second design, they thought they'd get rid of the little light that flashed. But the patient said, no, no. He said, they, we love to have that little light flashing that, that means that it's working. So they kept the light. Uh, they have control knobs. And the control knobs are a little bit recessed so that you can't accidentally turn them. And it turns out you want to, there's a question of whether you want to have the control knobs so that the patient can actually adjust them or whether you don't. Uh, because it's, you, know, you don't want the patient to be playing around, playing games. But uh, the on-off switch, there's the terminals. These two terminals at the top are going to be hooked to your wires, which are then going to be hooked to the chest. And output, the output square wave pulses, two milliseconds in duration. That's because time constants of nerve and muscle are on millisecond range. Um, and uh, let's see, it doesn't tell how many milliamps, but... Uh, but that's an example of the cardiac pacemaker. Here's a patient wearing one of these. And now they found that the problem of, of having the electrodes on the surface of the uh, chest was a problem. So they started putting the electrodes in through the chest wall and poking them down near the chest. And that worked better, except now that you have a wire going from the outside to the inside which is a way you can get bacteria and you can get infections. Um, so it was a problem, but it required less strong stimuli. So this was sort of the state of technology sort of at the intermediate level. You can just wear the pacemaker around on a strap, you can walk around, and now you can go home, you can walk around, you're mobile, as long as your battery lasts, you're in great shape. So, it was a breakthrough. And it was published here a paper with Lillehe, some other people, and Bakken uh, talking about their first transistor pacemaker, 1960, uh, was when they really began to manufacture these things. Okay. Now, sometimes it takes sort of an uh, interesting story to, to get these uh, things to really catch on with the public and the and doctors in general. And they implanted one of these in this fellow named Warren Mutson, 1959. And he lived for six and a half years with this thing. And not only did he, so he survived, he was one of the longest surviving patients in the early pacemakers. And not only did he survive a long time, is he was kind of a character. And he loved to do interviews with radio and TV. So they, they loved him because he was so colorful. So he would, they would come in, he'd show them his pacemaker, he'd tell them stories. And, his, his experiences really made the whole pacemaker industry catch on uh, rather excitedly. So we began to see around 1959, 1960, pacemakers becoming more common. All right. But now let's go and do another iteration. Let's look at the problems with this pacemaker and see what we can do. Okay, first of all, um, you don't want wires going into the skin. That's, that's not good. Uh, small battery, um, well these are the requirements that you really want for a pacemaker. You want a small battery and you want it to be able to last for several years. You don't want to be going in constantly changing the battery. What you really like to do is you'd like to have the thing small enough to implant inside the body. If you could implant it inside the body, you wouldn't have to have these wires going into the skin. So the idea now, the big push, was for implantable uh, um, pacemakers. Now, you also have a problem with the wires. The wires that go in and lead to the heart. Remember, the heart's beating. So the heart's constantly moving. Now, if you take a wire, which is a piece of metal, and you start twisting it, every time the heart beats, it twists. It doesn't take too many of those twists before what happens, metal fatigue, the wire breaks. So metal fatigue you have to worry about because you're not dealing with, I just did like five or six twists. You're dealing with millions, millions of these fluctuations. Uh, so you want to be able to design your electrode leads so they can withstand that and still be working for years uh, even though they've been twisted millions of times. You want to have the electrode uh, attachment to the heart stable. So suppose you have a way to attach 
to get the electrodes inside near the heart. You don't want them moving around a little bit because if they move and they pull away from the heart, then you have to turn up your stimulus. You're going to be constantly trying to adjust the stimulus strength to match where your electrode is. So you really want to have a nice stable contact with the heart. Okay, if you're going to implant the thing, you're going to have to make it biocompatible. So you're going to have to enclose it in some sort of covering <coughs> that will prevent, uh, that won't be toxic. And moreover, it, you can't let the body fluids, which are conductors or salt water, get into the pacemaker and short things out. So you have to have encapsulate it in something that's fairly waterproof. But the batteries that are usually used at the time, which are zinc uh, mercury batteries, when they work, they give off hydrogen gas. Now, hydrogen gas, it's not enough concentration to be dangerous like, like in a balloon where it could blow up, but still, it's releasing gas and gas is going to build up and if you're, if you're not able to get the gas out because it's enclosed in some complete waterproof, gas-proof covering, you're going to build up pressures inside the thing. So you got a problem, you got to figure out how to do the batteries and any releasing gas so it won't let salt water in, but will let the gas out. And finally, you want to have a transistorized circuit, 2 milliseconds, about 15 milliamps, well, it'll go about 70 pulses per minute. So these are the requirements you need if you're going to go beyond what we saw and you're going to build an implantable pacemaker. So, let us see what people started doing. There's kind of a debate about who made the first implantable pacemaker and that book I mentioned at the beginning of class, uh, uh, The Machines in the Heart, kind of goes through the whole history. One of the first ones was made in Sweden and here's a picture of it. And these things tend to look like hockey pucks when they first made them. Um, so, I don't want to claim that, uh, that Americans made the first pacemaker, but one of the first that was really caught on was made by Wilson Greatbatch, who also died a few years ago. Now, Greatbatch is another colorful character, so it's kind of interesting. This uh, history of pacemakers and defibrillators has a lot of early colorful inventors uh, in the early stages of the field. And Great Batch is maybe one of the most colorful. And he, uh, he would build these small implantable pacemakers, which then with his doctor collaborators, they can implant in patients. And there's stories, there's kind of interesting stories how he and his wife would, would test these. They had to get very good, accurate resistors inside their electrical circuit. So the wife would apparently uh, get up in the mornings and she'd test all the resistors and make sure they're all good and then give it to him and he'd, he'd wire up the circuits and they would, they would make these things. This was long before you had to worry about FDA controls and all everything so he could just make these in his, uh, in his house. And uh, there's his circuit. You can see it's still a rather simple thing. And it worked. So there's a picture of the first pacemaker. You can see the, the little circle disc-like batteries inside. The whole thing's kind of in a little puff of epoxy. So what do you need? You need a little circuit, you need uh, some batteries, and you need an output, which is probably right up there, which is a wire to hook into. It looks like there's a fuse there, but I'm not quite sure what that is. And this would be your pacemaker. It's about the size of a hand. Now, initially, they would implant these, they have to open heart surgery. So you open up the chest, you would implant the leads right near the heart, you'd implant the pacemaker, and you close up the chest. So it's very invasive. But then in the late 50s, they developed a way that, that's used currently uh, to implant these uh, transvenously. So what you do is you open up an artery, sometimes in the neck, uh, and you basically take your catheter electrode and you snake it up there. I compare it to anybody who snaked your pipes in the house. You're taking your snake and you're kind of sending it up through the, the veins. You want to use veins, not arteries, because you want the low pressure uh, side of the, of the circulatory system. So you snake it through the vein, in down through the in, superior vena cava into the right atrium. And if you want to, you can go through the, uh, the valve there and into the right ventricle. And there you have 
uh, a way to implant the pacemaker. Then you take the battery and, and circuit, the little, little puck, and you implant it right under the skin, under the chest. And the whole thing is now under the skin, inside the body. This is very easy to do because it's not open heart surgery. It's just opening the skin up and making a little pocket in the chest. And you've threaded it through. That's how pacemakers are implanted nowadays. And in fact, it's, it's so s standard that often you can do it as a uh, as outpatient procedure in the doctor's office. Now, if you have an elderly patient or somebody who's a little more at risk, you may have them stay overnight one night in the hospital. But you know, often for a person who's fairly healthy and you're just wanting to implant these just in case, you can do it as an outpatient procedure nowadays. Uh, it's, so it's fairly simple. And a lot of people nowadays will have pacemakers implanted in them. And you guys know pace people with pacemakers, grandparents or uncles or something? No. It's, uh, it's fairly common. Okay. Now. We had that problem with leads and the metal breaking. Well, one thing that people found is you can take a helix of wire, and you can so you can wrap the lead into a helix. It would be smaller than this one, this and longer, but this is just to show. And the helix can go like this many, many times, and the helix itself can bend quite a bit, but the individual little pieces of wire are bending just tiny amounts, that they're just all adding up in the helix. So the common way to make these leads is to make a tight little helix, which is then enclosed in some polyurethane or some kind of insulator, and that makes a lead that can last a long time. There's still possibility of lead breakage, but it's not such a big problem as it used to be since they use these spiral electrodes. And the other thing is you want to attach the uh, electrode to the heart. So there's a couple ways to do it. If you remember, the inside surface, that would be the endocardial surface of the heart, had a lot of, uh, a lot of fibers and what's called trabeculi. It's kind of a rough surface. So you can take and you put some little tines on the end of your electrode. I compare this to kind of like an anchor. An anchor in the ocean that has a big thing sticking out. It gets caught in the bottom of the ocean. Well, these things will get caught on that inner surface of the heart. So you thread the electrode in, you, you get it into the heart, and then the, you kind of get these things down caught inside that rough surface, and that can hold the electrode fairly tight into the surface of the heart. Another way is you actually have a little screw that you can twist in the back, and it causes it to twist up at the front, and you can literally screw a little screw into the heart. You don't want to go all the way through, but you can go a millimeter or two, and it can actually hold the electrode uh, against the heart um, that way. Now, um, both of these can do a little bit of damage to the inner surface of the heart. So what's done is you often make these electrodes at the very tip will have a little material that elutes or, or gives off steroids over time. It's made so that over months uh, the steroids will be uh, released and that reduces the inflammation, reduces the uh, damage to the heart right around the electrode. Originally they'd find that when you implanted the heart and you did the test it took very small currents but then the currents would grow over the next week as the damage spread. But with these steroid living electrodes it's not such a problem. And this is the case where when I had an interview with Medtronic about mid 90s and I I knew a lot about the electrical properties of the heart and wave front propagation. So I get into the interview and the first thing they ask me is, is how I'm going to improve the chemistry at the tip of the electrode to elute the uh, steroids. And you know, what can I say? I said, you know, I just, I don't do chemistry at the tip of the electrodes. I'm an electrophysiology person. So it was a fascinating visit, but I didn't get the job <laughs> because um, I didn't have the skills that they needed. But it's standard practice now to have these steroid eluding tips. They have the steroid eluding stuff on a lot of things. And nowadays when they implant these stents inside the major cardiac arteries to hold it open, if it's got some blockage, they'll often have those with steroid eluding stents so that they'll reduce the damage. Uh, it's very common at this point. It's, it's, the nice thing about it is it's very local. So you don't have to, you don't have to give a person uh, steroids to the whole body which might work, but they have a lot of side effects. But if you just have the steroids giving off at the tip of the heart and then it gets diluted to the rest of the body, 
uh, you can have a very local effect. So that's a little bit about the leads. Now the batteries. Uh, Great Batch himself, who designed the first implantable, at least in the United States, the first implantable pacemaker, realized that one of his limitations was the batteries, because they had these, uh, they had these batteries with mercury, zinc mercury batteries, gave off the hydrogen gas, and it was a problem. So he developed, he went off and started another company and developed some of these lithium ion uh, batteries. They're often what's used in uh, a lot of a lot of applications nowadays. In fact, one of their first uses was in flash cameras. And when you think about it, a flash camera is very similar to a pacemaker and especially to a defibrillator where you want to charge up and get a big capacitor and then discharge it and that causes the shock or the flash camera, the flash. So um, he developed lithium, uh, lithium iodide. So what it is, is you, as the, elect as the chemical process goes on, you build up a layer of lithium iodide at the surface between the lithium and the polymer and the iodine is in, is in uh, solution. So this layer will slowly build up, but there's no gas given off. There's no gases. Uh, now the problem is this layer is not a good thing and it increases the resistance of the battery and eventually that layer gets so thick you have to replace the battery. But uh, the good news is you can monitor and monitor the battery resistance. You know when it's getting close to being replaced, and then you just replace the battery. Uh, replacing the battery is kind of a big deal because you have to open the skin and take out the unit and either replace the battery in the unit or swap in a whole new pacemaker uh, can, they often call it. So you want these things to last a, a year or so, but it's not a huge deal. So you can make these so you have now these lithium ion batteries. So that was another great development. How these things prepared. And that brings us to one of your homework problems that's due on Friday. Uh, problem 47 uh, asks you to analyze one of these batteries and try to estimate how long they'll last. So it gives you some data, typically a 2 milliamp stimulus. If you get the electrode right down near the heart, you can get away with, with one or two milliamps of, stimula, of current, uh, which is usually about one voltage, one volt. So you're thinking about, what, 50 ohms of, uh, is it 50 or 500 ohms maybe of, of total resistance. But, uh, and you have these pulses, and let's say one millisecond, and it's delivered every second. And you want to figure out how much power. Well, just to remind you, Power is current times voltage. I gave you both of those. So you can calculate the power, but that power is only on when you're stimulating. So that's only on for one millisecond. So if you want to try to figure out uh, the energy in the stimulus pulse, you multiply the power times the time. Power is, is energy per unit time. Multiply by the time, you get the total energy. If you want the average power, well, the stimulus is only on one millisecond out of every second. So the average power is going to be one one thousand, some sort of the instantaneous power during the pulse. And then you can, once you have the average power, a lot of these batteries can have a certain amount of charge that they can release before they're, they, they aren't, don't work anymore. So the, the problem gives you some sort of uh, information to figure out the charge so you can figure out how long these batteries will last. And I'll warn you, in problem 47, you're going to get an answer that sounds way too long. It sounds uh, not, not absurdly long, but it sounds longer than what you expect. And that's because all we've looked at is the energy needed to cause the pacemaker pulse. And then one of the final parts of the problem, you add a little constant DC power uh, in order just to run the circuitry. And then you find that the, it gets down to a little more sort of reasonable uh, time that, that these batteries can last. So problem 47, I'll leave you to do it, uh, is just analyzing pacemaker batteries. So for those of you who might not be here at Bright Started class, you got the homework. That's one of the homework problems that's due on Friday. Bring your questions on Wednesday. So the next development of pacemakers. Uh, is by a man named Baru Berkowitz, 
and he decided that he's going to make what's called a demand pacemaker. And that is sometimes, for some problems, you don't need the pacemaker all the time. Sometimes people have heart problems that come and go, they're intermittent. So you plan a pacemaker so that you can stimulate the heart when you need it, but if the heart's working fine, you don't want to stimulate it. So he developed the demand pacemaker, and what he had to do is he had to have the pacemaker now an additional ability. It had to measure the electrocardiogram. Read the electrocardiogram, and then it also had to be able to do some simple logic to decide, based on the electrocardiogram, whether it's going to stimulate or not. So uh, these were developed in, uh, I don't remember when, probably uh, 70s maybe, um, these demand pacemakers. So let's see a little more about those. Uh, this is, nowadays, they use a code, and I think the most modern pacemakers may have additional codes, but the traditional way is three variables. The first variable in the code tells you which, where you're stimulating. Okay, I don't know how you'd ever have a pacemaker with none for the stimulus spot. But you can either stimulate in the atrium, or you can snake the electrode down into the ventricle and stimulate in the ventricle. Or you could stick in two electrodes and stimulate in both spots. The next letter in the code is where you sense. That's where you're measuring the electrocardiogram. So the original pacemakers didn't have that, so they didn't have any sensing. But you could sense in the atrium, the ventricle, or both spots. And then here's the logic involved of whether you're going to do, do nothing. That's the original pacemakers. You're going to trigger. If you see something, it will cause you to stimulate. Or you could have it set up so you're going to stimulate unless you see something and then you stop. That's inhibit. Or you could do both. So, again, our original pacemaker, the great batch original thing, is VOO. It stimulates in the ventricle and it then uh, doesn't do any sensing. And this works if you have, say, you have third degree heart block. One of the most common problems uh, that you need a pacemaker. You need to then, if, you're, if it's heart block, it doesn't do any good to stimulate the atrium because the signal doesn't get across to the ventricle. So what you need to do is you need to stimulate the ventricle. So you stick the wire down into the ventricle and then you just have a metronome stimulating, you know, maybe 80 times a minute. Uh, and there you have the original pacemaker, a VOO. Okay, you want to do better. So you make a demand pacemaker. The man pacemaker is going to stick, to, again, you're going to stimulate in the ventricle. But suppose, suppose you have third degree AV block, but it comes and goes. So the patient sometimes is walking around normal, and then for some reason, their AV block kicks in, and, and either they faint or they have to go sit down and they're ill. Well, you're going to record the electrocardiogram down in the ventricle. And so what you're going to do is you record a QRS complex. Now you're going to start inside the, inside the computer of the, of the pacemaker, you're going to start a stopwatch and it's going to be going. And if you see another QRS complex before, say, uh, 60 seconds, no, uh, not 60, uh, one second, you're going to not stimulate. But if you go a second and you still haven't seen another QRS complex, stimulate. And that way, if you're running along at least a beat a second, you're not doing anything, so you're not getting away of normal activity. But if you've got heart blocks and the signals aren't getting across soon enough, you're going to get um, stimulation. You're going to stimulate the ventricle. Uh, the eye means that <coughs> you would, the clock is set, and you will stimulate unless you record that electrocardiogram and it says don't. So you're inhibiting the stimulus by your logic. That's the demand pacemaker that they develop. So that allows you now to not have this continual competition. But when the heart's healthy, you don't want to have the artificial pacemaker and the natural pacemaker competing to see who can control the heart. That's not a good thing. So uh, this says that we'll only use the pacemaker we need it. Okay, now, one problem with this is that you still haven't gotten the <coughs> atrium and the ventricle to be synchronized. Uh, so if you have a third degree AV block, <coughs> atrium's working just fine, it pumps, and the ventricle you can stimulate and you can pump, but if they're not synchronized, you don't have the atrium filling the ventricle and then the ventricle giving the big pump and, and giving a lot of blood. So you can make a VAT stimulator. 
Okay, V, you're going to still stimulate the ventricle because if it's heart block, that's where you got to stimulate. But you're going to record the electrical activity in the atrium. And if you see a P wave come, that means the, ent the, vent the atrium contracted, then you're going to wait maybe 50 milliseconds, maybe 100 milliseconds, and then you're going to stimulate the ventricle. So this way you're getting sort of what the, nat the, the body naturally does. Atrial, a slight delay, and then the ventricle. You're getting the AV synchronous uh, signal. So a VAT, a VAT pacemaker would give you back that synchrony and allow you to have a much better heartbeat and be more effective. And you have other ones. Nowadays they're almost all DDDs, which means uh, they, you, can, you can program them with a wand that's electric, coupled by some radio wave to the pacemaker and you can have it do almost anything depending on what you type into the computer. So they can, they can do uh, pace, vent, ventricle or atrium, they can sense either place, they can program it however they want. Alright, so that's pacemakers. Before we go on, let me ask if there's any questions about pacemaker technology. Yes. How does it know, like, like, if you're working out, you need to increase heart rate, how does it know when to compensate for it to increase heart rate? Um, there are pacemakers that have little accelerometers built into them so that uh, they can tell if you're moving around a lot and they can increase the heart rate. That works, but not perfectly. Like, suppose you were riding on a train and it's kind of bumpy. Uh, it might interpret that as exercising and increase the heart rate when you don't want it. So it's not a perfect technology. I don't know of any... I'm, I, I'm not an absolute expert on these pacemakers. I don't know if there's any way that you can have some user control without making a dangerous amount of user control uh, to adjust for exercise. I think the ones that sense the, uh, the motion are the, are the best solution they have. Other questions about pacemakers? Yeah? Also, when they insert the, the wire through the vein, mm -hmm. doesn't that interfere with the valves closing? You know, you'd think so, but apparently it doesn't. Uh, if you, can, uh, you know, It's kind of an art to this, uh, this whole business of uh, threading those wires, but apparently if you get the wire small enough, you cannot significantly block. I mean, they, they have these different leaflets, and I would imagine you want to go in between two of the leaflets so that then, then they'll close. And I can't tell you exactly the biomechanics of why it doesn't, but it doesn't seem to be a major problem. Certainly, it's a smaller problem than the problem you had before you had the pacemaker. It's also on the right side, which is generally the lower pressure side. You might not want to do that on the mitral valve on the left side. Um, that, that, that's, that's another issue. Anything else on pacemakers? Yeah. Um, with the steroid or with the tips, mm -hmm. so does the body just kind of get As I understand it, you kind of reach a steady state and then and you're okay. But I, I know what you mean. You know, when it runs out, does that reset the clock to zero and have the injury grow? Um, I don't think so. I think that, that there's still a little bit of scar around it and it gets into a stable position, but it's not as big as it would have been. Uh, also, you can make these things elute. You can have a lot of control over how long these elute. You might have the thing eluting steroids for a year or something like that. So it's not it's not going to all happen in, in a week. Right. Okay. All right. So the next topic is the defibrillator, and there's two types of defibrillators. <coughs> there's the external ones and the internal ones. And first, let's talk about the external ones. Uh, oftentimes, there'll be automated external defibrillators (AEDs), and these are the things you find in grocery stores, on airplanes, there's even some around OU. There's one, uh, if you go up to where, on second floor of HANA, where the, uh, the pre-med office, advising office is, you got a defibrillator in the wall right there. Um, what you do is you has to take a couple electrodes, and these things usually are made nowadays so that when you get them out and you start using them, they have a little voice that just talks you through the directions. So you strap the electrodes onto the chest. 
And then the electrodes measure the electrocardiogram. And if the electrocardiogram looks anywhere near normal, um, it won't do anything. But if it detects ventricular fibrillation, which is what we talked about last class, if it detects ventricular fibrillation, it will then cause a large shock to go to the heart. So when you use these, you aren't actually making decisions on the more modern ones, whether to stimulate the person or not, which is good, because I don't think any of us would want to have to, that responsibility. You slap the electrodes on, and then the whole thing is automated to be able to make those decisions. You do want to stay away from the guy uh, who's getting shocked. He probably tells you to, because you don't want to get into the circuit. These defibrillator shocks are big shocks, and you don't want to, uh, to be giving them a hug when they get one. Um, so anyway, these are the automated external defibrillators that you see all the time. Uh, you don't want these automated external defibrillators. I mean, you want them to be accessible. You want them to be easy to get to for the public. You don't want kids playing with them. I mean, there's this trade-off between how accessible you want these things to be. But anytime you're at a place where uh, you might not be able to get to one, uh, you might want to carry one around. For instance, airplanes. Airplanes, you can have an emergency landing, but it may take a half hour to land. And a half hour is too long if you have ventricular fibrillation. So oftentimes, airplanes will have a defibrillator. Now, what if you go out, what if you go out camping, and now you're three-hour hike from uh, anyone? Now you got a problem. So if there's any risk at all that you're prone to fibrillation, then you, uh, you want to have an implantable defibrillator. Of course, if you don't have any reason to think you're prone to defibrillation and you go on a three-hour hike, and then you, for some reason, go into fibrillation, then you're just, there's, there's not many options. Uh, but if, you, if a person has a history where you think they might be prone to fibrillation, you implant the implantable cardiac defibrillator, or ICD. And these look very much like a pacemaker. You implant the main unit under the chest, and you thread the electrodes in. Actually, I forgot. I have some examples. I'll pass these around. This is a uh, pacemaker. And the lead goes into this hole here. And this gets planted right underneath the skin. And this is a defibrillator, just slightly bigger, uh, but not much difference. Uh, these are not the most modern ones, so they might even be smaller. But once you get it down to this size, there's not that much gain in making it even smaller yet. Uh, so these would be typical ones, so I'll, I'll start them around here and you can just pass them around. Um, so here's the defibrillators. Now, defibrillators aren't that much different than pacemakers. In fact, when, uh, when Bush was president, his vice president, Cheney, had some heart issues and he had a defibrillator implanted. But Cheney and their White House didn't really want to say that he had a defibrillator implanted, so that sounded like kind of a, a terrible thing. So what they did is they said he had a pacemaker plus implanted, which is strictly true, because almost any defibrillator nowadays will also be able to do pacing. They'll just be reprogram it to be a pacemaker as well. So it really is a pacemaker plus additional abilities. But I always thought that was kind of like calling a car a radio plus. I mean, you know, it's, it's because the main purpose of this thing is to do defibrillation. So he had a defibrillator. A lot of people have defibrillators. And these go in and they sit there and they record your electrocardiogram. And as long as they see any sort of reasonable electrocardiogram, they just do nothing. But they detect fibrillation, and they then apply the big shock to the heart, and uh, we'll be talking some more about how a big shock actually resets the heart. But if you apply a big shock to the heart, it will essentially reset the whole heart, and then you're back, and it will come back um, to a normal sinus rhythm. Now, the question is, what caused the fibrillation in the first place? If that keeps happening over and over, and you're shocking and shocking, you've got a big problem and they, they probably need some treatment. But as far as the short-term problem, with fibrillation, you're dead in 10 minutes unless you get defibrillated. This will defibrillate you. And no matter where you are, it just sits there and it, it records, and you can go on the three-mile hike, and if necessary, it will give you the shock. I mean, then you gotta figure out what to do with the person. Usually, usually, um, 
the person will fall over unconscious in fibrillation before the shock happens. There's a few seconds delay. So it's not usually something that they'll experience just when they're walking along. But I had an uncle who had a defibrillator implanted. And he told me that uh, sometimes, occasionally you can get a false positive. I mean, when you're programming these things, the worst thing you want to do is miss a uh, fibrillation case because the person dies. So you love it that work just right every time, but if you have to err, you err on the side of, of, uh, of being careful and you have a few false positives. And he said whenever his would fire a false positive, he called it being poked by a cattle prod. Now, I've never been poked by a cattle prod, but apparently it's a very uncomfortable big shock. It's not something you want. So ideally, you want to make these so they're not false positives either. But uh, it, it, it's, it's not a lethal, I mean, it's, but it's not something that's comfortable. And then normally, the person's unconscious when it happens. So, uh, so that's a little bit about the implantable defibrillators. Here's the simplest version of the circuit. I mean, this is very simplified. But basically, if you just take a battery and you hook it up to the heart, you're not going to be able to pass enough current. The battery just can't pass enough current to give a big shock to do defibrillation. So what they usually do is you have the switch over here on, on, on my right, and it's hooked to the battery, and you charge up a big capacitor. And once the capacitor gets filled, then you switch the switch to the left, and you discharge it through the electrode, and now that capacitor will discharge in just a millisecond and dump all that charge into the body at once, and that's what gives the big shock. So typically with these defibrillators, with the external defibrillator, uh, if it detects the fibrillation in the heart, first thing it'll do is it'll start charging up this capacitor. You know, it might take one or two seconds, and then it'll charge up, and then it will, boom, give the big shock. So uh, that's, and of course, there's a lot of other things that can happen too, but that's simplified. Now, defibrillation is a little bit of a crapshoot. Um, if you have the heart undergoing fibrillation, so remember what that means. That means here's your heart, this is a ventricle. You have a bunch of these little wave fronts going around in funny little loops all through the heart, kind of chaotically. And whether this uh, defibrillation works depends exactly on sort of where these, how the chaos happens to be situated in a given time. So sometimes the exact same strength shock will defibrillate and sometimes it won't. And it makes this probability curve. So this is the shock strength, the probability of success. Real weak shocks will never stay defibrillate. Strong enough shock will almost always defibrillate. And there is a, a, a sigmoidal curve like this. This is ED50 means you set it at 50% of probability would be this strength. Usually a defibrillator is set to about a 90% probability chance of, of, of working. So if you stimulate, nine times out of 10 it will work, and that one time it doesn't work, well, the thing will just automatically up the strength and, and give you another zap a minute, say, later. So uh, usually uh, it doesn't always work, but they're designed to try to keep the shock strength as low as possible and still I have a fairly reasonable chance of, of working. Because these shocks are not, I mean, first of all, they, they hurt if you, if you do feel them. Second of all, they can do some damage to the heart. <clears throat> uh, it's certainly a small problem compared to fibrillation and death in 10 minutes, but it's still, you don't want these things to be shocking extremely strong. You don't want these things to be shocking willy-nilly all the time. So uh, you, and the other thing that's interesting about defibrillators is when they're implanted in the body, you really need to set, figure out sort of where this curve is for an individual patient. So oftentimes in the hospital, they'll induce fibrillation and have the, the defibrillator shock and get rid of it just to get there, you know, to figure out exactly what the strength is, which always struck me as being scary because the last thing you want to do is you cause the heart to fibrillate. But if you're going to the trouble of putting in one of these defibrillators, you, you have to really figure out what strength the shock has. So that's, that's one thing that's often done with defibrillators. <coughs> and do they work? Well, here's some of the early data. This is 1996 data. Uh, they have <coughs> uh, percent survival as a function of time. So ideally, 
What you want is a straight line at 100%. Everybody lives. Well, they compared defibrillators to conventional therapy. So what this means, conventional therapy is really just drug therapy. There are certain drugs you can always give that will make you less prone to go into fibrillation. Uh, and they help some. But you can also do that drug therapy plus implant a defibrillator. And you can see in this example, the defibrillators had a lot higher survival until finally out here in year five, I believe they had to stop the test because at that point, there was such a dramatic difference between conventional therapy and defibrillation that uh, it was no longer ethical to do the clinical study because uh, <clears throat> how can you allow people to uh, just have conventional therapy when, when you could save many more lives by applying defibrillators? So they do seem to work. At least they, they do seem to, to be able to stop fibrillation. There's always questions about whether they truly extend life and whether they tr how much they improve the quality of life. But I'd want one if I was in a, in a situation where I was prone to, to fibrillation. Okay, so like we did last class, we're going to do a few little games here where you guys are going to be the doctors. So. Here's what the doctor is up against. Your patient is taken to the hospital after several episodes of fainting. Here's her electrocardiogram. Okay, describe how you treat this person using a pacemaker or defibrillator. What parts of the heart would you sense? What parts would you stimulate? What algorithm would you use? Uh, there's not a single correct answer for these, but uh, you have to explain and justify what you're doing. So, uh, this could be, a, type of question you might see on the final exam. Um, first of all, what is this person suffering from? What's the illness? Yeah? Third degree AV block. Third degree AV block. Um, yeah, I believe it is a third degree AV block, although the QRS looks a little wide, but I think it is. Third degree AV block. So what are you going to do about it? Anybody can answer this. What, if, if you have AV block, where do you want to stimulate? Atriums or ventricle? ventricle? Ventricle. Does no good to stimulate in the atrium. If you have AV block, the signal won't get through to the ventricle. And ultimately, the ventricle is what has to be. So the first letter in the code for your pacemaker is going to be V. Okay. Where do you want to, uh, where do you want to record? Well, you record the atrium. If you're trying to get your uh, synchrony between the atrium and ventricles, you might consider recording in the atrium. But look at this. If you allow, if you you uh, have a very slow ventricular rate, let me see actually how. Uh, I would suggest recording in the ventricle because what you really want to do is you want to increase though that ventricular rate. But that's one of those cases where you can argue it either way. And so if you record in the ventricle, then what do you want the pacemaker to do? Well, one thing you could do is you could basically treat it like a demand pacemaker. You could say, okay, I'm going to, I recorded a QRS complex. I'm going to wait for one second. One second is five of these boxes, two, three, four, five. And if I don't see another QRS complex, I will stimulate. And, but if I do see a QRX complex, I won't. That is basically an inhibition. So this would be a VVI, would be one way to treat this patient, uh, which is a demand pacemaker. So you could treat this as a demand pacemaker, or you could do kind of your idea of you record in the atrium. Every time you see a P wave, you could then wait for 50 milliseconds to stimulate the ventricle. And then you'd be using a VAT pacemaker, and it might actually be better because you get the atrioventricular synchrony. So one could argue that that's even a better way to do it. Um, either of those would be a correct answer to this problem. What you want to at least be able to do is justify why you're selecting it. Yeah. So would it be better to put DDD? DDD? Or I guess for V. 
you could do VDD or, or even DDD pacemaker, but then the question is, how do you program it? So all you're really doing is you're, you're moving the question down from what type of pacemaker to implant to how do I program the fancy pacemaker that I actually do implant. So if you answered this on a test, DDD, but you didn't say how you were going to program the pacemaker, you probably wouldn't get full credit. Because you could almost always say DDD on any pacemaker and, and it would be okay. Yeah. Uh, so like on a test, would it be just like this? Or would we have the chart that showed us like, you know when you first showed us what the letters stand for, would we have that to look off of? Or would it just be no? No. That, that chart that we had is something you should know. Um, because there's only three, you won't have to know any fancier codes, but there's three codes in each, each spot. There's three letters, and each letter can have like four different things. So that's 12 possibilities, uh, 12, you know, four times four to four. So you need to know that, that code. Um, and you need to know the 12 electrocardiograms that we talked about last class. I wouldn't give anything too fancy, but it might be one of those 12. So those are the things you got you to know. And then the rest is pretty much reasoning out what you want. Whatever the problem is, heart block, you got to stimulate the ventricle. Okay, well, okay, that was a success. you got to save the patient. Let's see, here's another patient. Your patient is taking the hospital, complaining that she has no PEP. This is her electrocardiogram. Describe how you treat this person using a pacemaker to get their blood. Blah, 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 blah. Um, how are you going to treat this patient? No pep. This is, what's this patient's problem? Not a very big problem, but it's a little problem. It's a little bit of sinus bradycardia. I mean, if you're more than five boxes, you've got sinus bradycardia. This person looks like they're just a little more than five boxes, maybe five and a half. So the first thing I would do, if I was the doctor, is I'd give them some drug that might up the heart rate and the problem goes away. But let's suppose you try that and you aren't able to treat it with drugs. So you decide to try to use a pacemaker. What sort of pacemaker do you want to use in this case? Where do you want to stimulate? Ventricle. Well, do you? Uh, you want the ventricle to beat for sure, but any time that the AV node looks like it's working properly, then there's an advantage to stimulating in the, in the atrium because you're guaranteed to get the normal, uh, the normal AV uh, node delay and the, the heart will be working in synchrony. So, in general, if the AV node's blocked, you got to stimulate the ventricle. If the AV node's working, you want to seriously consider stimulating the atrium. And there's no hint of even first-degree heart block here. The P wave to the QRS is less than one box. No hint of first-degree heart block. So the, heart, the AV node looks like it's working just fine. So, if you're going to stimulate the ventricle, or excuse me, the atrium, where do you want to sense? You might as well sense in the atrium too, because you're going to want to, so you have AA, and then you could set it up like sort of a demand pacemaker for the atrium, which would be AAI, that would be one way to do it. So suppose this person only has this uh, problem sometimes. Well, you can sense electrodes in the atrium. You can sense the electrocardiogram in the atrium looking for P waves. If you see a P wave, then you can um, stimulate, or, no, excuse me, you have the electrode in the atrium. Okay, it senses a P wave, and then you start your clock. And if it doesn't sense another P wave until after one second, stimulate the atrium. If it does sense a P wave for one second, you do nothing and you just let the heart go on as it does. And you just sort of solve a sinus bradycardia problem. Probably one of the best ways to solve sinus bradycardia. Although, you could stimulate the ventricle, but then you lose uh, atrioventricular synchrony. You could stimulate the ventricle using VAT. You'd get atrioventricular synchrony, but it probably wouldn't be as good as the natural 
seem to me, unless you had everything adjusted just right. Yes? So for any node works, could you just do like AOO, where you don't have to sense for? AOO, you could. You could do AOO. Uh, now, the only thing you lose is there's all the nervous control that goes into the SA node that's telling you, allowing you to adjust the heart rate according to the way the body works. And if you just got a metronome, which is basically what you'd have in here, if you had just a metronome, you lose that. But the actual heartbeat would look, everything would look fine. You just lose a little bit of control over, um, and you'd also lose the ability to turn the whole thing off if this comes and goes. And so, so there's some disadvantages to it. But you could do that. And of course, most people would, would put in DDD and then they'd uh, be able to program it. Now, if you do that, if you have a DDD pacemaker and you go to all the trouble of putting in a lead both in the ventricle and the atrium, you can uh, then, if the problems worsen over time and they do develop AV block, you just, it's just programming. There is an advantage, though, to not having to thread the uh, lead into the ventricle. It's just, I think, what you said. Uh, you don't have any risk of a wire getting in the way of the uh, val valve between the atrial and ventricle, atrium and ventricle, if there's no wire there. So if you can just stick one wire or two wires into the atrium, one to sense and one to stimulate, it might be an advantage. So there's certain advantages to AI. Um, all these uh, you have to consider. But I just want you to understand what the logic goes through. Yeah. Um, can you if you see a P wave, and then after say less than one box or 0.2 millisecond, 0.2 seconds, you see a normal-looking QRS, that really means that the signal is going from the uh, from the atrium to the ventricle. P wave originates in the atrium. QRS originates in the ventricle. If it's got the normal delay between the two, the AV node is working fine. If it's got a long delay, then the AV node has first degree block, and if, this, if they're just not correlated, that means uh, this is something more severe block. In the, uh, it's not correlated, it's third degree AV block. So that's how you can really, really tell. You look at the thing, and you see. Basically, you say, "Okay, I'm just going to look at the electrocardiogram itself and not worry about its rate. Does it look normal or not? If it looks normal, the AV node's got to be working fine." And here's one more of these. I don't have just enough time to do this one. Your patient complains of palpitations. His father died of sudden cardiac arrest 30 years ago. This is an electrocardiogram. What are you going to do with this patient? First of all, what's, what's the electrocardiogram telling you? What was that? Premature ventricular contraction. Premature ventricular contraction, right here. You get a normal looking electrocardiogram, normal, and then a big, wide, funny looking pulse. That's uh, somewhere inside the ventricle. It fired prematurely and gave you this funny looking signal. That's probably what he's feeling when he's feeling, complaining of these palpitations. Probably he's feeling these things in his chest. He's got a family history of cardiac arrest. What do you do with this person? Um, I think the VA, or VAT pacemaker, because you want to pace the ventricle to stop it from premature firing, you want to sync it up with the atrium. That's not what I would do. I mean, it's, it's a reasonable description, but, but this person's got, what's this person at risk for? I mean, he's got a family history of cardiac arrest. What happens in cardiac arrest? Almost always, the heart goes into fibrillation, the person dies. And the other thing is, these premature uh, ventricular contractions, as we're gonna see in a future class, if these things get so that they're hitting right about at the previous T wave, you can trigger a reentry, a tachycardia, which decays in the fibrillation. So if I was looking at this, I'd say, you know, this person could, not for sure, but they could go into fibrillation if, if one of these things happens at the wrong time. So what do you do with a person who you're worried about going into fibrillation? Yeah, that's what I would do with this person. I would put in an inflatable defibrillator 
uh, so that uh, you know it may not solve the short term. You may do some other things to solve the short term, but uh, uh, it's kind of hard to get rid of the palpitations uh, with a pacemaker. Um, but at least you're you can you know that you're, you're not going to go into cardiac arrest like the dad, and uh, you're going to be able to shock him out of it. So there may be other things you want to do to cause more short-term problem, but this is the kind of patient who you're going to get the implantable defibrillator in. And hopefully it'll just sit there for 20 years and not do anything. I mean, that's what you hope. But this person's at risk enough. I mean, you might ask, why don't we just put one in everybody? Um, but if you're not really at risk, it's, it's just pointless. And you can't ever tell for sure because there's always stories about a great athlete who all of a sudden dies. Cause, but... Uh, but if you see somebody who's truly at risk of fibrillation, that's the person you want to get the fibrillator. Okay, uh, we got to stop. But this is just a final pretty picture. We'll talk about this more in a future class, and that's it. So, uh, next class we're going to move away from the heart and talk about the brain and the electroencephalogram, and then we'll be done with Chapter 7. So I'll see you all on Wednesday.